I'm happy to be here with you this morning on this uh, cooler day, and I'm uh, rejoicing with you as Pastor, Pastor Blaine Newhouse and his wife Kathy have accepted the call to come here to Bahrain, and so it's really exciting that they will be here, um, hopefully in the next uh, couple months, I don't know what their timeline is, but it's an exciting time for them, and it's an exciting time for you guys as a new pastor is coming, and you can welcome him and, uh, and help him get settled here in Bahrain. Um, I forgot to ask for the clicker. Can someone bring that down? It's, it, yeah, that's fine. Good. Uh, so today what we're going to do is we're going to talk about the Garden of Eden. And one of the things that I really love is I love, I love good theology. And I know that some people view the- theology as really dry and really boring, and it's just all these heady ideas that no one really cares about, and I want to know practical things. But, and I, and I get that, but I want us to consider theology in a particular way, and I want us to picture theology, thank you, I want you to picture theology as a feast. There we go. I want you to picture theology as a feast. And when we consider and think on and meditate on good theology, we feast on the goodness of God. We find satisfaction in the deepest parts of who we are. And the reason why I want to use a feast is there's three pieces to the feast that I think are really helpful. And the first thing is that when you go to a feast, when you, and I'm thinking about like if you go to an Eid feast or if you go to, uh, for the Americans here, Thanksgiving feast or a Christmas, uh, like a Christmas gathering where there's lots of food. A feast is nourishing. The food itself gives you strength. It gives you nourishment that you need to grow. It sustains you. So when you go to a feast, a feast is nourishing. The second thing about a feast is that usually when you go to a feast, there's other people there. A feast is community. (coughs) A feast is community. And in community, we strengthen our relationships with God and with each other. So good theology strengthens our relationships with God and it strengthens our relationship with each other. The third thing is that a good feast, a good feast is satisfying, right? Nobody, nobody goes to a feast thinking, oh, I have to eat raspberry pie. Nobody says that, right? We're excited about a feast because the food itself is good and the food itself brings us joy. It brings us nourishment, but it also brings us, there's things that bring me nourishment that do not bring me joy. When my wife tries to make me eat kale chips, that's, I, 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 know, I know it's nourishing. It does not bring me joy. It brings her joy, which is fantastic, but not me. So with that in mind, I want to keep that in mind because what we're going to do today is we're going to look at, the, at this story of the Garden of Eden, and, uh, and we're going to look at three theological ideas that come out of that, but then what are the practical implications, and what are the things that, why do these things matter to us today, here, and now? So that's kind of the first introduction. We go to the second introduction. Before the fall of man, if you ever join me and my family to, for dinner, one phrase that you are often going to hear, usually from me, with my kids, I've got three kids that are all in elementary school, one phrase you're usually, you're, you might often hear from me is, before the fall of man. And then it's followed by some fantastical idea of what the world was like before Adam and Eve sinned. So it might go something like this, before the fall of man, the rivers flowed with chocolate. Before the fall of man, you could pick cheeseburgers off the cheeseburger bush. Usually it's some food-related thing. Usually it's in unlimited amounts of an unhealthy food, you know, but that's, uh, it's where, that's, where my, that's where my mind goes about what the fall of man was like, what, the, what things were like before the fall of man. And these are, these are funny jokes, and the kids laugh, and they say, no, 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 it wasn't like that. But the story of the fall of man, though, is actually much more serious. It's not quite so nice, and we wonder in this story, how can we come to the table of good theology and feast on the goodness of God in a story that is not that great? Let's look at the story here first, okay? So if you turn in your Bibles with me to Genesis chapter 3. So everyone, if you have your Bibles with you, open that up, and let's look together at Genesis chapter 3. We're going to look at three parts of this story. (coughs) 
The first part to this story is the sin itself. So we know that Adam and Eve are in the garden. They were told, do not eat from this tree. Do not, you can do anything you want to. Do not eat from this tree. And the serpent, who was more crafty, came and convinced Eve that she should eat, that she could eat, that it was a good idea to eat. And that God's instructions were insufficient. And so she did. And then Adam was there. Now, Adam was standing right next to her, right? You know, so later on when Adam says, Lord, it was this woman you gave me, he's, he's standing there the whole time, right? He's culpable from the very beginning. And so they took the fruit and they ate. This is what we call the fall of man. Before this, man lived in the paradise of the garden. But with their own responsibility, they chose to ignore God's commands, and they took of the fruit and they ate. The second thing that we see in the story is that after they eat, they immediately go and run and hide. They knew that something was wrong, and God starts walking through the garden to meet them. Sorry, he, he was walking through the garden, and he's looking for them, and he's calling out to them, where are you? Now, I think we know that God knew where they were, so God is engaging in that conversation with them. <clears throat> so God's walking through the garden, and he finds them, and they are obviously ashamed of what they have done, and they're ashamed of their nakedness, and God says, well, who told you that you were naked? But I think the thing that we think from here is that, is that God, that I want to take from this is that God was walking through the garden with them. And this is really critical. We're going to get to why it's critical later on. But God was walking through the garden when he found them. The third thing that we want to see here is we have there is a curse. And that's a bulk of, of, of what is there from verses 13, uh, sorry, 14 to 24. So there's a curse there on four things. On, first of all, on the snake. And in verse 15... God specifically says that he shall bruise your head and he shall and then the snake shall bruise his heel. Then in verse 16 there is a curse on childbirth and there will be pain in childbirth. Now I have never been pregnant. I've never given birth. But I have been around when, uh, for the births of my three children. And I can say that, that I, I don't think that it is a pleasant experience. There's a curse there. Second, there, sorry, third, there is a curse on the relationship between the husband and the wife. There's going to be marital strife. There's going to be problems in marital relationships. Does that sound familiar to anyone? No? Maybe, okay, maybe it's just me. I don't know. So. <clears throat> and then in verse 17 through 19, there's another curse on the ground. Work is going to be difficult. It will, fruit will only be borne by the sweat of his labor. So we see these, particularly, the, the, not the, necessarily the first one, but the second, third, and fourth one, the childbirth, the relationship in, 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 uh, between husbands and wives and in work. Does any of this ring true? Does anybody, has anybody here ever had a problem at their job? Probably, right? So we see here that there is a curse that has not just, was not just for Adam and Eve, but has permeated through the rest of creation. So we have three things here. We have the eating of the fruit. We have that God meets them in the garden and then there's a curse. These are three things that happen here. So what does this tell us? What are the things that we want to learn from this? Well, let's start first. We're going to go, we've gone down and now we're going to go back up. So the first thing we're going to look at is the curse here. So what is the truth of the curse? I think the first thing is, is that, is that there just is a curse. And, and I would suggest that understanding this is a piece, not the full, but a piece of the good news. Now, why would that be good news? 
Well, it's not good news in and of itself. It's not good news that the world is cursed and there are problems in the world. But I think it helps us put together the puzzle of life. Because oftentimes people ask the question, why do bad things happen to me? Why do bad things happen to good people? Why does God allow things to happen? And we get frustrated. Why is it like this? What's wrong with me? What's wrong with the situation? What's wrong with my church? Not that there's any problems here, right? No, what's wrong with the world? And part of the answer to that is that there is a curse. The world has been cursed by sin. And we see that in other places in Scripture. In Romans 5.12, Paul says, Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, that sin being Adam, came into the world through one man, and then death through sin, so death has spread to all men, because all have sinned. Sin permeates the entire world. In Jeremiah 17, 9, Jeremiah writes, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? I want to highlight these things because I think for some people this seems obvious, but there are so many messages in the world that tell us this is not true. Some people think that, you know what, people are, people are, basically, people are basically good. Well, People do do good things, but people have sinful hearts. And some people might say, well, people are good, but they just forget to do good things. It's a memory thing. It's a practice thing. They've been, they've been, uh, they've been influenced by society. And I think the hard thing here is that we see that a lot in, in media. We see that a lot in movies. Well, people are basically good. People, are, people do good things, but at the end of the day, all of us have sin in our hearts. Some people say, well, karma makes bad things happen. It's bad karma, it's good karma. That's why bad things happen. Other people might say, well, it's instinct and evolution. Evolutionary forces have caused us to react in ways that want to preserve our, geni- uh, our, our biological line. And the problem with all those explanations is that they just don't quite line up. And oftentimes the answer for those explanations is we just need to try harder. If I can try harder, I can be good. If I can get my child to try harder, then they can be good. If I can get so-and-so to try harder, then they will be good. And there is an important place for, for discipline and for spiritual disciplines. And don't hear me saying that, that we don't have any control. We do have, have control. But if we think that it's by our effort alone, then we're going to be frustrated. So the first truth that we learn here is that the world is cursed. And the good news of that might just be that now, well, okay, hold on. If, if the whole world is cursed, maybe things start to make sense a little bit to me. The second truth that we find, moving back up, that God meets them in the garden, the second truth is this, is that God was with them in the garden. And that is critical to understand. We know that God is above us. We know that God, we cannot comprehend who God is. But somehow, in his separateness from his, separateness from us, from his, in his incomprehensibleness from us, Somehow he is, he started out with us. That's how things started out. When God created man, God created man for his glory. And for his glory, God was made, or sorry, man was made to be with God. There are some people who might say, well, God's so far above us that that we can't, we can't know him, we can't understand him. He's, so, we're, that's, he's totally separate. But that's not what we see here in this passage, that from the beginning, the design, from the beginning, the design was that we are to be with God. 
And so part of the good, so at the beginning of the, of, 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 of the sermon, I talked about the, the metaphor of the table, the metaphor, sorry, the metaphor of the feast, right? And part of that good news of the feast is that we are invited to the table to be with God. It's not just that there, it's not just that there is this feast and we're not invited to it. There is a feast there and we are invited to that table. Some people think that we're not invited to God's table. God has his table up there and we have our table down here. Others don't see God as a person at all. He's, an imp- he's not a he. There is an impersonal force out there. Others might think there's no God at all. But this story tells us very clearly here that at the beginning, the design is that we are with God. And so now we start to see what the problem is here. On the one hand, from the beginning, we are designed to be with God. On the other hand, the world is cursed because at the end of the story of, of, of Adam and Eve sinning, they are cast out of the garden. They leave. They are no longer in communion with God in the same way that they were at the beginning because of the curse. So there's this question. This curse separates us from God, but at the same time we're designed to be with God. How do we, how do we reconcile those two things? And the, and the third truth that we learn from this is this. Even though we made the mistake, even though Adam and Eve made the mistake of eating the fruit from the beginning, there is a plan for redemption that was there from the beginning. Genesis 3.15 says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. He's speaking to the snake. He's speaking to Satan here. So from the beginning, from the very beginning, God says there's something wrong here, but in the end I'm going to make it right. Now we don't know what that is based just on that verse. But we know that from the beginning, there is a plan there that God's going to take care of things. From the, it is, God is not making things up as he goes along. <clears throat> and we know that that unfolds through Jesus. And Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death. That sounds like the garden right there, doesn't it? The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So sin excludes us from the feast of the Lord. It keeps us out. But the good news of this story is that God's got a plan to invite us back in. Now, we don't come back into the feast on our own terms. We don't come back into the feast just through our good works. I think this is one of the other big challenges, particularly in media, is that, is that in movies, in music, in pop culture, man has become the measure of all things. And when man becomes, the, when I am the most important thing in the world, when I am the measure of what is good, then, well, why am I excluded? I am the measure. But we are, but we are not the measure of all things. God is the one who measures us. And on our own, because of sin, We are separated from God, but we are invited back through Jesus. And so the truth here is not just that there is redemption, but the truth is that there is redemption through Jesus Christ. One of the things, too, that we think about with this is that we were made, and I forgot to mention the verse here, John 15, uh, um, 11, is that we were made to be with God so that we can have joy. When we say that God has a plan for redemption through Jesus to bring us back, it's not just that we get to do it because 
That's the, impart, the, the impassionate machine that God has made. It is for our joy. It is for our benefit. God is glorified when we are satisfied in Him. One of the other things that we see in Matthew 1, to 23 is that God is with us. Behold, this is, uh, this is Gabriel talking to, to Joseph about Jesus. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? It means God with us. God designed things from the beginning for us to be with him, for us to take joy in him, for us to commune with him, for us to be at the feast with him. That's how God designed it. And sin comes in and breaks that design and separates us from God. But God has a plan for redemption in Jesus. And so when people come back and say, well, you know, I don't know if there is a God. Or God is completely separate from us. He doesn't, he's, he's, completely other and completely different, and he has nothing here with us. And that's not true. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus is the embodiment of that. And so we are invited to the feast, not on our own terms, but in God's terms through Jesus Christ. I said at the beginning that that when I say before the fall of man, I'm usually with the kids at dinner, we're usually describing things that are are, are nice. But at the end of the day, we're not made for rivers of chocolate or for bushes that grow cheeseburgers or for an insert for yourself, whatever thing it is. So if, you, so if you were to say that, before the fall of man, what's that thing that you would really want to be there? Instagram page with a million followers. I don't know. And those things are all right. But at the end of the day, we are made for something far more than that and far better than that. And we have it in some ways now because Jesus came and he's left us with a comforter, the Holy Spirit. We know that not everything is right now. There is still a curse. There are still bad things that happen. There is still enmity between husband and wife. There is still pain in childbirth. There is still difficulty in work. Those things have not changed completely. But because we have hope in Jesus Christ, we look forward to a future where those things will not be true. And here and now, because of our relationship with Jesus, with God through Jesus, we find joy there as well. And when we look forward, we look forward to heaven. And heaven, heaven, okay, when we think of heaven, heaven is not just some sort of paradise, nice, uh, nice resort. A big, big hotel with a nice cushy bed, a jacuzzi in every room, a big feast of eat, a buffet of eat all you can want. I don't know, maybe those things will be there. I've not been to heaven before, so... But that's not what makes heaven attractive. I'm going to end with this. I'm going to end with a picture of what heaven is. And it's Revelation 21, 1 through 5. I'm going to start at verse 3. This is a, this is a picture of, of what heaven will be like. Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. See that? He'll dwell with them. Not separate. It's not a paradise where we're here and God is somewhere else. He is with us just like it was in the garden. He will dwell with them and they will be his people. And God himself will be with them. Again, he says that God will be with them as their God. And so we go back to some of these problems here. We're separated from God because of our sin and that gets reconciled. And then he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death 
shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. The truth here is that there is a curse and that we are separated. But the bigger truth is, is that God has designed us to be with him. And we have that through Jesus Christ. We have it now in part. And we have a hope that is sure for the future. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that you are sovereign over all things. We thank you that you are with us through your Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you that you made us to be with you, that you did not design us to be just here in our own world and you are in your own world, but that you have designed us to be with you. And so, Father, work in our hearts that we take any of the idols that we have, any of the things that we put before you that we value before you, and replace them with you. Father, we thank you that you have sent your son Jesus to reconcile us in spite of this curse, and that that is a sure thing, not something that is only possible, but that when we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Father, that is a sure salvation that we have. Father, give us us strength to live in a sin-cursed world, both to endure, but also to love people. Father, give us hearts that want to be more and more like you, that in spite of the sinfulness of our heart, that you are working in our hearts to make us more like you. Father, we ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.